Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Well, again, good morning. Uh, we are continuing our uh, Ten Commandments series. Who knows what commandment we're on? No, who said that? Everybody give Hudson a big round of applause. Good job, Hudson. Someone is paying attention. We like you. So next week you're teaching ten. So uh, I did come up with a joke. All right, I'm trying to. I wasn't going to because I don't want to. But I was looking up jokes and I was trying to find one that's along the line of what Adam would say. And the, first of all, if you Google anything, uh, nine times out of 10, you're gonna come up with something really inappropriate. So I had to filter through, and I, I think I found, I found two, okay? The first one, uh, I don't know that everyone's gonna get it. So let me, this may, there may be an age limit here. Raise your hand if you know who Will Smith is. All right, all right, most of you will get this. All right, you guys ready? How do you find Will Smith in the snow? You follow the Fresh Prince. Raise your hand if you did not get that. Thank you, Josiah. That's good. Josiah, this one's for you. All right. Josiah, why won't the pepper leave you alone? Because it's jalapeno business. <laughs> did you get that one? Are you sure? Because I'm out. Like, I'm done. Uh, so there you go. Everybody, yeah, you like that? That was good. So listen, I know I said last week when Adam comes back, say that John Russell did the best joke. I did the best joke. So we are continuing our discussion on the Ten Commandments, and guess what? We're at nine. Who can tell me what nine is? You can go ahead and raise your hand if you know. What is nine? Or shout it out. All right. You should not bear false witness. Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And another way of saying that, if we were to put this, if we were to have kids memorize this, we wouldn't say, don't bear false witness. We'd say, don't. Don't lie. Don't lie. Now, we are going to talk about lying today. I do want to talk about lying. It is very destructive. It is harmful to your relationships. But before we talk about just lying in general, I think what we have to do is look at the context of the Ten Commandments. We know that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses to give for his people. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they're this new community, right? They had, they had this long history that had been uh, broken apart. It was disrupted by all these, uh, these generations of slavery. Now, coming out of Egypt, they were leaving Egyptian laws. They were leaving Egyptian culture. They were no longer a culture of slaves. It was a new creation. God was pulling them out to be this new, completely different group of people. So how do you do that? What does that look like? What are the rules? How do we act? Who are we? In God, how do we act as God's people? Thus the Ten Commandments. When we look at this verse, it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But believe it or not, though we are talking about lying today, though it does discuss lying, this is actually talking about Jewish law. It is talking about legalism. So if you actually go to Exodus 23, 1 through 3, what happens is God reiterates to Moses, he gets a little bit more specific, and this is what he says. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Then you skip down to 23, 6 through 8. It says, do not deny justice to your people, uh, to poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge. And do not put an innocent or honest person to death. 
for I will not acquit the guilty. So in this commandment, God is actually talking about, in the ninth commandment, he's actually talking about in a legal sense, you wouldn't bear false witness because it could be the difference between life and death. If you go all the way to Deuteronomy, you learn a little bit about Jewish law. See, if someone were to break the law, and let's say the result would be stoning, if you've done something to warrant stoning, and that would be adultery, murder, theft a lot of the times, it wasn't enough to have one witness. Because I can make anything up. I can say, man, Ford, with his shirt and his shoes, oh, that guy gets me, oh, man, look at his, his face, oh, Ford. And I could say, hey, you know, I saw Ford uh, hit someone with his car. Stone him. It, wouldn't, it didn't work like that. I would need a second witness or even a third witness. More than one person has to see Ford hit someone with his car. But the trick is, because, again, it's easy to get more than a couple witnesses that don't like Ford. Ford, I'm just kidding. You're a very popular guy. L listen, it's, it's very easy to get two people to be against something, especially when those two people have something to gain. So here is the rule. If you serve as a witness, the perpetrator cannot be stoned until one of those witnesses threw the first stone. One of those witnesses, the death, the actual sentence had to, be, it had to start being carried out by one of the witnesses. And if it came out that you lied, if it turns out that that person was innocent, whoever threw that first stone would end up being the one who would stone in turn. It would be levied against them. They would get stoned. So all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, I don't like Ford, but I also don't like being stoned to death. So when we're looking at this verse, we're actually talking about the legalism. But this is a very prime example of how lies can be the difference between life and death. Here's the number one thing I want us to walk away with today. Lies are destructive to relationships. It's destructive to relationships, and this is not beyond your imagination. So wives, let's pretend for a second you know your husband's loyal, you know your husband has not committed adultery, you know that you can trust them, you have faith in them, but remember when they stopped smoking 10 years ago? And then all of a sudden, you're going through his things and you find a pack of cigarettes. It completely changes the dynamic of the relationship. All of a sudden, questions that were not there before about the relationship start to form. It's damaging. And even though, even if it's just that one thing, and you guys, raise your hand if you got kids, you know this, man, your kids lie to you. And typically, it's not like, okay, did you steal a cookie out of the cookie jar? Yeah. Not a big deal. That's, don't stone him, you're fine. It's just a cookie, you're fine. But when they say no and you find out they did, it's no longer about the cookie, is it? What's the worst part of finding out that your child lied to you? You can't trust them anymore. The trust is broken, the relationship, there is a fault, there's a break in the relationship when someone's dishonest. And this is just common sense. And I, man, I hate to use this quote, uh, from Nietzsche, the guy that said that God's not dead, but he, had a, he does have a really good quote, that he did say something very, very important. I'm not mad that you lied to me, says Nietzsche. I'm lied that I can't believe you anymore. See, lies are a destructive, destructive force against the relationship. And it's something that Satan uses very, very well. So Satan is the father of what? Lies. If life comes from relationships, if our relationship with the Father gives us life, then the best way to sever that relationship is a lie and bring us to death, Satan's going to use it. Because lie, lying is a very effective way of cutting off a relationship between each other and between the Lord. So we go back. I mean, you can go back all the way. Let's go to Genesis 3, 2 through 4. You've got the Garden of Eden. Right? You've got Adam and Eve, and they've got this relationship where everything they need is handed to them by God. A lot of people believe it didn't rain. Water came up naturally in wells. They had all the fruit. They, they didn't work, men, amen. They didn't have any work to do. They didn't have any labor. There was no pain, and there was no death. And in the afternoons, they get to walk with God. How amazing does that sound? That's life. Actually, that's life as intended. But then we have this scene. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. And the serpent said, you will not certainly die. 
So Satan lies. First line of the Bible, you're not going to die. But we know, of course, because sin turned our world upside down, that life intended now had death in it. And sure enough, at the end of her lifespan here on earth, she's dead. She died, along with her husband, Adam. Because that lie that we bought into created this dysfunction between us and our relationship with God. All of a sudden, what was a perfect relationship now has a small fault. And the guys, the story of the Bible, and I, I love this, the story of the Bible, especially to the unchurched, but sometimes to us, it feels like a list of rules, a list of commandments. It's a history. It's do's and do nots. But really, if you, if you look at this book as a love story, where we cheated on the Father, we separated ourselves from the Father, and he's been doing everything in his power to get us back to him. That's what the Bible's about. It's the reparation of that relationship we were supposed to have with God, the whole story. And if you read it, it's us messing up, and that's a, it's us buying into lies, and it's us sinning and being separated over and over and over again. And God sends up a, a new covenant here and a new covenant here until finally the, the story of Christ comes and the final covenant. And here we are. We have now this way to repair a relationship that we broke when we gave in to Satan's lies. So lying has a very, very, very strong uh, diminishing effect on relationship. And I think that's why he's the father of lies, isn't it? If you think about it, if his goal is to come and kill and destroy, separating us from God would be the quickest way to accomplish that. And lying just about does the job, doesn't it? It does. If, uh, if I don't know, if diet soda was the best way to be separated from God, he would be the father of diet soda. But it's not. It's lying because we buy into it. I've also heard it said that uh, lying is, it's, uh, there's two parts to lying, right? It's a mutual agreement. You lie, but you also agree to be lied to. When you accept the lie, you've agreed to take that as truth. And what Satan does is he dangles whatever we think we want to believe right in front of our faces. That's what we call temptation. We buy into the temptation. Just a minute ago, not but 30 minutes ago, I, I had the kids, we were doing Sunday school, I said, what? who makes us sin? This is my favorite, this, here's my favorite lie. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do nothing. We have free will. What he did is he lied, and we bought into the lie. And what happens is we end up separating ourselves from each other. We are no longer able to witness to each other. I can't stand up here and talk about the Bible if you've known that I'm a liar. The relationship is damaged. I am no longer a good witness to you. I, it, it's, and it's something we, even, even though it's so destructive, and I think if we raised it, show of hands, honestly, you're a pretty honest person. Put your hand up if you're a pretty honest person. This is not a trap. If you consider yourself, you're like, I don't, what are you about to say about me? Uh, it's fine. If you think overall you, you know to avoid lies, you know, if, if, if it's something you don't need to lie about, you're not going to lie about it. You don't go out of your way to say, that's right, I fought a bear once, you didn't, okay? That's fine, you're more or less. But we know in our society, like, we don't trust liars, right? And there's all these, you remember that, uh, that show that came on called Lie to Me? It was about a, a guy who was a lie spotter, and he was trained, he could tra eye motion, microfacial tics, uh, gestures, repeated sentences. He could pick up on the finest, minute details and say, liar. But try it this way. If you want to spot a liar, look at their relationships. How deep do those relationships go? Because someone who has a tendency to be dishonest tends to have really shallow relationships. Then someone figures out that they're lying, there's a problem with relationships, so they move on to someone else. And then because of the lying, the relationship doesn't get very deep, so they move on. So if you know someone who has a lot of friends, they know a lot of people, but someone doesn't know them very well, they're lying. That's something that's, that, that happened. It's, it's funny to me that we know that that's Satan's handiwork. The question is, do we sometimes as liars, are we, are we working on the behest of Satan? I wonder, are we damaging our own relationships for him? Does he have to put in a lot of work when we lie? If we make lying a part of our, of our habit, a part of our life, are, are we doing work on the behalf of Satan? Because really, as Christians, we're supposed to emulate who? 
Jesus. But when we tell a lie, who are we emulating? Satan. But it's something that we've come to accept in society. I mean, can you name another commandment where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I just, this is just a little white murder. A little white murder never hurt anybody. It's almost like saying, I'm a little pregnant. No, no, you're all the way pregnant. You all the way lied, right? But we, we tend to accept this idea. Lying is acceptable to an extent. You say, honey, how do I look? Does this make me look fat? And you're like, no, right off the bat. Hey, do you like, is it too much pepper? No, no, it's not too much pepper, right? Little white murder, little, <laughs> little white lie there. And it, I, I can tell you how broken I am. I've got two kids, and if you've got kids, you, if, man. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got two kids. Listen, I've got two liars. I've got one toddler. She don't lie about nothing. She's mad. Ah! I mean, you know, the two kids, that, they're the ones who betray. And if you have kids, you know, like if you raise a toddler... Sin is real. <laughs> Sin is, <laughs> it's not nature versus nurture. It's God versus evil. I mean, our kids do some ridiculous stuff. And you're like, where did you, where did you learn that? Did, uh, did you say something like that to them? Because I didn't. Where are you picking this up? Sin is so natural to my children. And this is how natural sin is in our world. Uh, they've got a bedtime, right? And I'm, I'm strict about bedtime because bedtime really means mommy and daddy time. That's what that is. So I protect that with an iron fist. Everything else, I don't care. But I put them in bed, and I'm like, all right, guys, stay in your beds. You face that way. You face that way. No, they share a room. No talking. Don't make me come back. And I get, I get like the glare. Do not make me come back in here. You know, and I'm aggressive. Other time, otherwise, I'm just the sweetest dad in the world. Right, Mom? Okay. I'm lying. So, so uh, yeah, so seriously, but I'll, I'll, you'll hear it. We're sitting in bed, we're doing whatever, we're watching Netflix, we're, I don't know, who cares? But, and you hear, ha, 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 and they're laughing and they're playing. And you go up there and I, I'll open the door and Harley is older, so he's smarter. So he's already in bed with, his, with a blanket over his face. So I come into the bedroom and, you know, Bowie, he's got his leg hiked up and he's looking at the door like, and I say, Bowie, are you out of bed? And he'll look at me and say, No. Harley, did, were you out of bed? No. Okay, well, someone's lying. Someone's lying. And what's funny is I walk away, and I'm like, get in your bed. You get in your bed. Don't lie to me. Get in your bed. You know, I'm, I'm mad that I got lied to. But really what happens is I'll go in back to the bedroom and just be like, what happened? I'm like, man, I don't want to talk about it. She's like, what's wrong? They've gotten out of bed before. I'm like, no, it's not it. You think I'm about to say it's because they lied to me. But in all honesty, I'm, I'm really frustrated that they didn't lie better. Because I'm like, really? Like, if you're going to lie, do some homework. Like, think about Put your ear to the door. I don't know. Just move. Stay close to your bed and then hop on. Manipulate better. Do your homework. I get frustrated that my kids are not better at deceiving me. And now that Harley is, I'm like, go back, go back, go back. But we accept it. To, to an extent, we do. We accept lies in our relationships. And we, we accept lies. Oh, we accept lies all over the place. But it, it, really, it really destroys relationships. It, it, it's insane that we allow it to continue to the extent that we allow it to continue. Now, guys, w this generation, the millennial generation that we're dealing with now, we talk about millennials as like a hot topic. The one thing, the only thing that millennials are sick, or he uh, sick of hearing about is the word millennial. But one of the topics with the millennials is that you guys understand that your kids are the most advertised to children in the history of man. The information age, man, they've got, they've got ads coming out of the TV, they've got ads coming out of the computer screen, they've got ads coming out of their phone. Funny enough, but the millennials know to take everything with a grain of salt a little bit better than the generation before it because they have very little trust for the world around them. But for the older folks, the parents, what's interesting to me is that living in the information age, you think that you'd have more information of value, that you've got access to more truth. You don't. You have access to more lies. And the lies that you read off the internet, guys, I'm telling you, if, if you're getting your information from the internet, there is not a person in this room who can filter the truth enough to live off the internet. You will not find enough truth to sustain your life by looking up things online. Now, a couple years ago, I had to replace a water heater on a bus and I, a water pump on a bus, and I, I did it. I did it through YouTube. 
but it is not the secret to raising my children because it's full of lies. The only place that I can go that is packed full of information on how to live is right here in this Bible. So what we tend to do is we take information from outside sources, and then we repeat it. It's like, hey, it worked for me. But the truth is it's not, it doesn't coincide with what's in here. The truth that you find on the internet, the truth you get from your friends, all that stuff has to be reconciled with what's in this book. So someone, when someone asks you for advice, I want you to refrain from pointing them to a YouTube video. I don't want you to send them a good article. When you're talking about politics on Facebook and you're arguing, I don't want you to find a news article. If you want to share the truth with someone, your first priority, <laughs> the first, your first resource is right here. It's, the, it's scripture. Otherwise, you might find yourself perpetuating lies. And it's very damaging. It's very damaging. What I wanted to talk about today as far as lying, and I know that we're, we're talking about lying in general, um, is something that we do here in the church. Like, we, we raised our hand. I know that you guys overall consider yourself very trustworthy people. You're not openly lying. You're not going out of your way to deceive people, and that's good. Round of applause for you guys. That's great. Oh, really? Yeah, round of, good. that's good. That's good. I'm glad you guys are living in accordance with the word, but there is a, ty there is a type of lie that I think runs rampant throughout the church with a capital C. That's the church across the world. It's something that we do all, all the time. I want to turn to a story in Acts 5. We're going to go Acts 5, 1 through 6, and it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you've heard this story, you know more or less what happens, and we're going to go over it, but I need to set up some context for you. Acts 5 is the blossoming, the explosion of the new church, right? The first church, the church of Acts, man. Jesus came, there was Pentecost, he, he went back up, then there's Pentecost, and these disciples who were confused while they're following around Christ, all of a sudden they're filled with the Holy, Spout, the Holy Spirit, they're filled with power, they're doing miracles, and we're seeing witnesses, we're seeing, we're seeing new believers go, wow, by the thousands, by the thousands, a very working model. Something real is happening. And if you're following this church, what's happening is a lot of these people, right before uh, 5, the very end of chapter 4, these people have a crazy lifestyle. What they're doing is they're selling their property, they're selling all of it, and they're leaving every single penny at the feet of the apostles. If one of your kids said, oh yeah, there's this group, and I just joined them, so I sold all my stuff and gave them the money, you'd be like, okay, it's a cult. We need to step in, something's going on. Because it was so radically different and so strange to the world around them. So these people who have, and they have honest, they're having an honest, authentic, genuine, sincere, truth-filled experience with the Lord. The fruits of this is that they're not living for money anymore. They're not living for possession anymore. In fact, they're happy to get rid of it to serve God's purpose. And these apostles are taking everything, all this money from these properties being sold, and dividing it out as the mission needs. They're dividing out to members who are in need. They're giving it to people who need a new pair of shoes. Someone over here needs bread. Hey, we know of a community over there that they're going to need some cash. Their widows aren't being fed, and so on and so forth. Then we have Ananias and Sapphira. What we tend to do in the church is not necessarily outright lying. It's the lie by omission. Everybody say lie by omission. It's not so much a direct lie as it is an indirect lie. It's so not, not so much telling deceit, using words to spread deceit. It's living in deceit. So what Ananias and Sapphira do is they sell some of their property. If we go to Acts 5, it says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to a human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. And if you continue the story, Sapphira comes in later, and Sapphira goes through the same thing. Only this time, Peter says, 
did you or did you not, did you give us the full amount? When you and your husband sold the property, did you give us the full amount? And she just flat out lied. She said, of course it was the full amount. And again, just like her husband, she drops down dead. Pretty extreme sounding. Pretty, pretty extreme. Yeah, I want to look at the story. If you understand what Ananias and Sapphira were trying to do, if giving all, giving everything was a fruit, the fruit of their relationship with God, we're seeing that Ananias and Sapphira did not bear the same fruit. So you can understand that Sapphira and Ananias did not have the same relationship with God, did not have the same Holy Spirit dwelling in them as the rest of the believers. So where is the mistake? What was this mistake that Ananias and Sapphira made? Was it only giving a portion? Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you, if you have property, you own, own property. If you own property, put your hand up. All right, look. If you were to go and sell, sell that and bring this church only a portion, we'd have to bring out the defibrillator because Adam would just pass out with joy. What? You did what? It wasn't necessarily that he held back. The issue is he was trying to purchase respect and authority from people in the church. He was saying, look at me. We, we worship the same God. I've got the same relationship you have. Nothing's wrong with me over here. I've got the same spirit as you. I'm in the same place as you. Please respect me. Please accept me as one of yours. Please believe that my relationship with God is perfect. But that wasn't the case. So when Peter calls him out and says, you haven't just lied to man, you've, you've lied to God. That means his relationship with members in the church was damaged. His relationship with God was damaged. And in this time, this early church, the church of Acts, Jesus said that he was going to make his church, his church was going to be built, and nothing could stop it, not even the gates of hell. He wasn't going to, at this time, let a lie come in and destroy his church because a lie has that power. A lot of the drama I see in churches is either a lie between someone and someone else or a lie to themselves. I see people lie to themselves more often than not. We were talking on Sunday or on Friday for our Bible, I'm sorry, Wednesday uh, at youth, we were talking about the lies that we buy into. Let me, let me break your hearts for a second. The lie that your children, your youth buy into all the time is that they're not worth anything. That they're not smart enough, that they're not attractive enough, that they're, they're not smart enough. And they buy into that and they go into survival mode. And they start, they take the bar. God has a plan for you that's right up here. Giving everything. Putting your life on the line. Putting your money on the line. Giving up your possessions. Living for God. Here's the bar. And you're told, hey, you're not smart enough, you're not attractive enough. What your kids tend to do is they take that bar, they put it right down here. And they don't achieve half of what God had for them. Or they walk away from God altogether. See, in a relationship where there's a problem, if the problem is not addressed, the relationship cannot grow. It doesn't get deeper. The lie by omission keeps your relationship from becoming what it needs to be. If me and Jasmine have a secret between the two of us, our relationship is on hold, it is on pause, it is frozen in place and time, it cannot prosper. If you look at Ananias and Sapphira, I'm wondering if their story could have ended a little bit differently. What if Ananias and Sapphira, they did what they did, they sold their property, they brought a portion, and instead of saying, hey, here's all of it, please respect me, what if Ananias had said, Peter, I'm, I'm not where you are. I'm struggling. I, I'm not in a place where I can fearlessly give everything. And I don't know if it's a sin or if I'm selfish, but I don't, I don't believe the way you do. I, I'm struggling. And it doesn't seem like you're struggling with this. What, Peter, what do you have that I need? How do, how do I fix this? How can I have more Christ in my life? How can I get to a place where I'm not afraid anymore? I wonder if Ananias' story would have not ended with him dropping dead. Because God doesn't just straight up smite 
the non-believer. He wants the non-believer to find him. He wants the non-believer to get to a place where he can live sacrificially and with joy and not be bogged down by stuff in the world and the lies that we're told, but be above it. But what we tend to do, what we tend to do is we're so concerned about what the neighbor in the pew next to us thinks that we don't go up when the altar call comes. And every week we've got two people standing by for prayer. Last week there was three. They had to box over who was going to get to pray. They were that excited to pray for someone. And I don't think they got, they maybe got one person to pray for. If in this room, every single one of us is in a place where our relationship with God is so great that we don't need prayer, this is the holiest place on earth. And I think even then, if I look at people who are giving up their money, you look at the Church of Acts, and they're giving up their money, and they're giving up their place of authority to work for Christ. Even then, the idea of someone praying for them because they, have, they understand their father, because they're so close with their father, because there's no lies to divide the father from the believer, they understand the power of prayer. They understand the power of the altar. If I said, hey, I'm praying for you, someone who's a real believer, someone who's really got it, someone whose relationship is really strong, will be jumping up and down saying, amen, thank you for that. You're dedicating your prayer life to me. I'm going to be walking on cloud nine. I've got amazing stuff in store for me. But someone who has the opportunity to be prayed for and to confess a struggle they're going through, is they're living by that lie of omission. They've gotten to a place where they're so, they're so terrified of what the person next to them thinks that they're not going to have the relationship that God wants to have with them. And what a pity, what a pity to set the bar that low. And God has, man, I, God created us, and he, he has a plan for us, and if we can just get our relationship right, we'll be right there, but we, we don't believe that we can do that. And we're so stuck into holding on to our secrets instead of giving them up that we won't jump over that high bar with God's help. We're being, we're being dragged back by this lie. I think one of the greatest lies that Satan has ever told and that we've ever bought in the church is that you're okay right where you're at all the time. If you attend on Sundays and you're volunteering to cook and you go to small group, here's your bar. That's it. And why don't we let go of those lies? Can someone tell me, you guys know that truth is painful, right? It can be painful. Now, we know that lying is wrong because if we go to Proverbs, I've, I found literally 12 different Proverbs that say, uh, let's see, Proverbs 12, 19, truth, uh, true lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. Truth lasts forever. It's permanent. Lying, it's temporary. It dies. Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates its victims and a flattering mouth works ruin. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who live it will eat its fruit. So we know, again, that lying is destructive. It's temporary. It brings death and division. But that doesn't mean that truth isn't painful. Truth can be very painful. I, you know, as a pastor, working with people you know, for the last, what, going on eight years, you know, what gets, you know what freaks me out? And don't be afraid to do this. When someone comes up to me and says, hey, Daniel, can I talk to you? I'm like, oh, great. What is this about? What did I do? What did he do? What is this? What? Oh, man, the drama, it's coming. I can feel it. It's like a tornado or a sandstorm. It's coming and no one can stop it. So, yeah, there's that panic. You, you guys understand that panic? Have you ever had someone pull you aside and say, hey, we need to talk? You're like, do we need to? Like, if you wanted to, I'd feel better. But do you need to? Because need usually means that one of us is going to walk away crying, and I don't want to have that. Or my favorite, arguments between a spouse, you get so angry that none of you talk. Right? There's no going forward in the relationship after that, bro. That's it. You're stuck right there. Whatever that topic is, because it's too painful to approach, the relationship cannot get better. 
So you come to church, and Satan says, hey, you better not say anything about this because I can I guarantee you, Jocelyn, she's going to judge you. She's waiting. Her, I, when the altar comes and the prayer team's over there, and we're waiting for people to get, you know, we're singing the last song. We're waiting for people to come up and confess or admit that there's a struggle. Jocelyn's out there going, oh, yeah, that's right. I knew you were a sinner. I knew, look at you, you sitting face. I knew it. That's the enemy. And if you are actually Jocelyn, if you're actually doing that, you believe the enemy's lie that you're better than that person. Sorry, Jocelyn. Sorry, Ford. I'm going to pick on you too for the rest. It's fine. You can find me afterwards. Daniel, we need to talk. Um, the, but it, the lying, the, guys, the lying is so destructive. It's, it divides us. Our relationships are, are ruined by this. And if you think about it, the idea of witnessing, of being a real believer and witnessing, it's exponential. If I look in this room and I say, okay, well, there's maybe 60 to 80 people here. I say, if there's 80 people here, no, maybe 90 people here. If each one of you go talk to two people, how many people have been reached? Anyone do math? 180 plus the 90 that are in here, right? And if those 180 become believers and that you guys see the trend, it's like the world's best uh, uh, pyramid scheme. If we're to go out, we're multiplying, and those multiplies are multiplying. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But the lies divide us. Satan has an amazing tool in his pocket. Those lies divide us. We can't be witnesses when there are lies between us. It stops the exponential growth. And I look at the church of Acts, and I I don't want to be the bad guy here. Don't get me wrong. I love this church. I love this church. But the church of the modern day not exploding at the rate that, it's, that it was in the Church of Acts, you got to stop and think about it and say, what's different? What's different? And there's so much that's different. But I think that one of the key things is how much we lie to ourselves. How much we say, you know what? I need to go to the altar. I need Christ in my life. This broken part of me needs to be addressed, but I need someone's respect more. Lying by omission. So here's my challenge for you as we wrap up. I know Hudson's looking at his phone telling me to hurry. Guys, just as much as the lie can damage the relationship, truth, though painful, though difficult, though terrifying, it heals. Jesus said in the New Testament, throughout the gospel, it's recorded a total of 78 times, I tell you the truth. First thing out of mouth, the Satan's mouth was a lie. Who are you going to emulate? Are you going to be the healing force that Jesus was? Are you going to carry the Holy Spirit and give into it when it tells you to speak? Are you praying for the courage to speak truth when it's difficult? Worship team, you guys can come up. I think that sometimes what we do is we avoid opening that can of worms altogether. You've got pastoral staff here. You've got elders. Raise your hand if you go to a small group. Guys, if you go to a small group, you have instantly a better connection with the people in your small group than you do to me as a pastor. There are believers who are willing to hear you out, but it's kind of like the idea of going to the doctor. I don't want to go see Dr. Ford because then I'm going to find out I have something. I'm not going to confess to someone who has my best interest in heart that I'm not where I need to be with Christ because I'm going to find out that I've got something. If you find yourself leaving this room on Sundays, leaving youth, leaving your small groups and not feeling like God was talking directly to you, there may be a lie in your life that's holding you back. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that final song. We're all going to worship together. And after we're done worshiping, I'm going to pray for each and every one of you. I'm going to pray that we are released from the lies. That we are given by God the courage to address those lies. And to live the way he asked us to live. To jump over the bar he set for us before he created us. Let's pray. Father, we're we're praying today for a complete breakdown. Father, we're praying today that you would help us make 
that internal catalog, Father, what, where, are, where are our iniquities? What does hold us back? What secrets do we have that keep us from having a growing relationship with you? Father, we're praying for courage we just don't have, typically, Father. We're praying to overcome lies. We're praying to admit and to confess to lies in our lives. We're praying that whatever, whatever holds us back, whatever we need freedom from, that we are able to be honest and to just ask. Lord, give us a heart of confession. Break down the walls that tell us that we're not good enough. Break down the walls that have us convinced that someone's going to judge us, Father. We know that our relationship with you is at the center of it all. That every, everything you want for us, our, your plan for us, your will for us, it, it comes from understanding that everything else should be held at so, such a low value compared to who you are. That we should have contempt for ourselves and for our lives, for the opinions of others, for our money, and ha have you in just the highest regard. Fill us with faith right now, Father. Before we dismiss, Father, before, before we finish this prayer, I'm praying that there's someone in this room who's thinking, what holds me back? <coughs> what have I not confessed to? How am I lying by omission? Where is my faith, Father? And what could make that faith greater? What could make my relationship with you closer? Father, I'm praying that right now someone in this room is taking an honest account of their relationship with you and thinking through what it is that holds them back. And Father, I know we've got this prayer team. I'm going to be held, hanging back. Father, I'm praying that someone would come. Not because I want them to come, but because they need to come. Because you've been waiting for them to come and confess and to give things up. Father, there's so many people in here that need healing, both physically and spiritually and emotionally. God, I know. I know. I, I know it. Father, we're praying for a breakdown of who we are in you and who we need to be in you. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.